Welcome back. This is chapter three, adding weapons to the Liar Starter Project. In this video, we're going to go over some of the basics around uh, creating new weapons, how the weapon spawner works, a little bit around the quick slots and the inventory slots. Um, and largely as a precursor moving into items, um, as much of the knowledge we can pick up from the weapons gets applied to the items uh, and the inventory systems. So rather than doing a full uh, walkthrough, there are many videos out there that show you how to duplicate the various assets and set up various guns. Um, I'll try to take a little bit of a different approach through it in navigating through some of this content, uh, and then hopefully everyone can pick up a little more information. So let's get started. All right, so in our project, um, as we said in earlier videos, we are attempting to do nothing in the content folder. So I tend to collapse it, and that allows me to make sure that I'm not mistakenly editing it. You'll see our various folders that we've been talking about so far in my Shooter Core Plus is where I've gone ahead and put the extra uh, weapon data. If you look at the map, this is uh, a copy. It's not the actual map. Um, you have Shooter Gym, which I left alone. That is unmodified, has no new content, and basically is exactly as it shipped. I copied it and called it Shooter Gym Full uh, to enable me to look at different capabilities. So when we're in this map, you'll see I've got six weapon spawners. The three green are the standard weapons that come out of the package, and the yellow are the, one, the three that I, that I added. Um, and so if we go hit play, you'll see a spawn in, and you'll note that the weapons are rotating, uh, the meshes are positioned properly, and they're basically mimicking what the standard ones are doing. As I uh, select one, so in this case the rocket launcher, you see that in my quick slot two, I have the ro rocket launcher. If I switch to the first quick slot, I can use X to drop the weapon. So I have two more slots. I'll pick up the grenade launcher and the uh, uh, submachine gun. So each of these fires very differently. That one is a very scattered, uh, random pattern. The rocket launcher fires straight. I have to adjust some of that and then the grenade launcher lobs based on angle. You'll note the ammo count is at the bottom for the grenade launcher, uh, off to the right side of the reticle for the submachine gun, and at the bottom for the rocket launcher. So the rocket launcher can hold three, that's why there's three lines, whereas the submachine gun has a lot more bullets, and the um, Grenade launcher has six. You also notice that the icons to the bottom right, when I switch, I currently have three rockets in the gun and six in spare ammo, and you see the shell casing for a total of nine. If I go to the uh, submachine gun, I have six in the rifle and 60 in spare ammo. And then if I go to the rocket launcher, you see I have uh, two in the chamber and 10 in spare. Hitting R will reload. Shifting those numbers. Here I can reload submachine gun and then reload the grenade launcher. So as I scroll through them, the pictures change. So here, for example, I have nine rockets. You see the icon showing rockets as the ammo type versus uh, shells. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, so that's basically the three weapons in the, that I've put in and let's look at folders. So first, um, uh, just some basic texture icons for the ammo and the weapons. Uh, the two on the right are the style that, uh, Epic, uh, in the Lyra project use. And um, so I attempted to mimic those with the blue outline blur around them. But then for the rocket launcher, I just took a, a very standard um, texture file. And then these two are the, are the ammo. And so I've tried in Shooter Core Plus 
and in all the plugins, I am trying to mirror any of the folder structure uh, from the other folder. So if I go in, for example, into content, you'll see UI, you'll see HUD, you'll see art. So down in my uh, plugin, I'm following the same overall structure. You'll also notice that for each plugin, you end up with your game feature data asset. And if I open that, a couple of things to note is there's the ability to have your tags and tags become a very important element um, added to your configuration path. So in this case, the plugins, game feature, shooter core plus config tags is where any gameplay tags that I create will get stored. Um, I'm also taking an action to add my gameplay queue path um, as the current directory plus gameplay queues. So this tells the engine that there is um, gameplay queues to be processed uh, in this ad. And then I'm not adding any primary assets to the asset manager in this particular plugin. I do in other plugins, but not for, not for this because it's just simply adding uh, more weapons. In the weapons, or let's go to the queue, I guess, first. In the gameplay queues, we have the various uh, queues that are firing based on the weapons, and they are responding to a particular tag. So if we open the weapon queue, and you'll see the various elements of the sound effects and the uh, particle effects, but they're specifically listening to game, gameplay queue weapon the weapon ID, and then fire. So this queue will automatically fire whenever it receives this uh, tag. Same for these other ones, are just different tags. Then for the weapons, again, following the same conventions, um, I'll go into this one first. Um, I did elect to make the physical assets here as opposed to the standard. The standard has the weapons in the content folder. And then they have a particular weapons folder here where you'll see the various assets, uh, the materials, the meshes, the textures, etc., which is separate and distinct from down in Shooter Core where they have some of the other uh, weapon data, right? Sorry, Shooter Core here, where they have the weapon data um, beyond the asset. So in the Lyra project, the shooter core contains all of the assets that are related to the weapon, except for the mesh materials and animations, which they have in the standard project. So in my plugin, I've opted to put them together. So if I say I just created an asset folder below where I'll keep my mesh materials, textures, and animations. For the mesh, um, you need a skeletal mesh and a static mesh. The static mesh, obviously, for rotating around in the pickup, uh, being dropped into the world. The skeletal mesh uh, to enable you to, you know, do things like reloading, etc. Um, I did do a level sequence and a control rig, primarily so that I could uh, generate some basic animations. So, for example, I have my basic fire animation, which I created in the level sequence. And it's pretty, oh, let's move this over here. It's basically just turning the canister on fire. So every time I fire, the canister turns one uh, section. So we created the asset using the control rig so that we have that asset available to us. I've duplicated any of the dry fire, uh, fire equip and reload animations for now. Um, these are generally good enough for now. They probably will be authored later. But for now, I've taken the rifle or, and or the shotgun, which is close enough. But you need you know, your animations. So you need your reload and your fire. These are the animations on the actual weapon. These are the animations on your actual character. Um, then, of course, I said you need your meshes. And then the balance of those assets are here. And there are a lot of videos on, on these different assets. The important thing to know when you're doing this is you've got basically your gameplay ability for fire and reload. You've got your inventory ID, which is the ID that 
ties to the inventory system. Um, you've got your uh, reticle, both the crosshair in the middle that can change and the ammo counter that changes on screen. Those are assets here. And a lot of that stuff is tied together in, in these data tables here. So one way to look at this is through the weapon spawner. So if I actually edit the weapon spawner, you'll start to notice a few things when we go through here. So let's go to the event graph. So when the weapon spawner starts up, it basically takes the mesh and you know pops it on top of the weapon spawner. And then on tick, it's just updating a parameter for the Niagara effect. Those are pretty basic. Um, whenever you pick up an object off the weapon spawner um, or it finishes its respawn timer, these two events are fired off, which are basically just visual effects. Uh, the activator deactivates certain particle systems, et cetera. Then you have uh, this broadcast failure message, which is a bit interesting because what it's doing is it's showing a bit of modularity. When a player goes over a weapon that they have, it will trigger this broadcast failure message if, it, if their ammo is full. It then grabs the player controller object, it makes a message, and then this is a, a struct, and then it broadcasts using the gameplay message subsystem. So it broadcasts this ability user facing simple activation fail message. It's a mouthful, but basically what it's saying is, hey, when this thing happens, I just want you to broadcast this message. And this is the very first good example of separating logic, because what this does is the UI is listening for this. And when this event gets triggered, the UI picks it up. So if we scroll down to that particular message, which is here, go to more actions and search for references, your, oh, sorry, popped up here. You'll see that the weapon spawner uses it, which we know because that's what we were in, but so does the ability failure feedback widget. So if we edit that widget, we'll see that what it's doing is as soon as the widget's initialized on screen, it's immediately hidden and it sits there listening for this message. So this allows this widget and the weapon spawner not to know about each other at all and still function by passing this message through. So it receives this message, it then goes on and does you know its checks and its components, whatever it needs to do. So basically what that separation of those two allows, oops, I'm here somewhere, there we are, is when you play and you run over the pistol, the spare ammo full flashes up on the screen. You'll see it to the right of me. That's that message. So the weapon spawner is triggering the, the, the tag. The tag's picked up by the UI and it displays the spare ammo is full. So good use of separating two objects that we might have hard coded together uh, in the past. If you look at the, um, let's go back to the weapon spawner. So that's that message. The main function in, in here is give weapon. And a lot can be learned from give, give weapon inside the weapon spawner. So weapon spawner uh, fires the give weapon. It checks whether or not we're in post game phase. So that way, if it's over, there's no need to pick up the weapons. So it, it stops that, just returns and exits. If we are still in the game, then what happens is a couple of things that are interesting. The controller, so we get the received pawns controller, and we get the component by class for the quick bar and the component by class for the inventory manager. So the player's controller has two components on it. One is the quick bar and one is the inventory. There's probably more components, but in this particular example, those two are, are components that it's using. It then stores them into two variables, 
it just checks that the inventory manager is valid. And if the inventory manager is not valid, it just exits. But if it is valid, then we use this function out of the inventory manager to find the first item stack by definition of this particular weapon. So it looks into the inventory manager and says, hey, do I have this weapon? If it does, it'll fill in the existing weapon instance. If it comes back null, then this will be null. So the, the system is going and checking into the inventory to see if I have it. Uh, it's also grabbing a reference to the quick bar, which we'll use in a few minutes. All right, if we already have the weapon, then it's basically just gonna do the uh, ammo check duplicate true, which is down here. And here you'll see that we, uh, we will give the ammo to the player by using uh, these stats from item definition and tag stat count. So, which is an interesting way, we'll show that in a few minutes, that they use a <gasps> gameplay tag and record the quantity on that tag. Uh, so we do that, we add the stack to the spare ammo tag, and then we just fire off uh, the thing was, uh, event was occurred. Here's where the case where we would broadcast that failure message and that would show up on the screen like I just showed you. If we didn't have the weapon, then we're gonna get the weapon. So the weapon can be added as a pickup. It goes to the quick bar to see if I have a free slot. Those slots seem to be starting at zero, one, and two based on this check. And it would be a minus one for failure. So it'll give you a minus one on the failure side. From there, it's executing a gameplay queue to choose some visuals. It's grabbing that inventory manager and it's adding this item definition to it. So it's giving the inventory this new item. And what comes out of that is an item instance object. So the definition goes in and it generates an instance object, which then gets added to the quick bar. So the quick bar picks up the instance of the object and stores it in the quick bar. It then goes on to just continue some other checks and other components. Finally, it sets the active slot in the quick bar to the weapon we just picked up. So it'll automatically ship weapons when you pick it up. So let's see that play out in game. Forgetting to do that. So when we roll over a weapon we already have, it either will give us the ammo or it'll tell us that we're full. So in this case, this time it gave me ammo. And then when it respawns, it will tell me it's full. I'll wait for that. When I pick up the weapon I don't have, it will add it to my inventory, add it to the next available quick slot, and then cycle me forward to the next quick slot. So that means the gun gets handed to me and you'll see that the quick slot moved to number two. Here, quick slot moves to number three and I can just cycle through the quick slots. Now, if I go back to get the ammo, it's ammo is full. So that's showing you kind of how the weapon spawner interacts with the data assets. You can learn more by looking at the item definition. So interesting concept are these fragments and we'll be using fragments a lot going forward. Um, any item definition, which is this data table and then the corresponding um, instance object that we looked at a few seconds ago has a number of fragments that can, can be added, don't necessarily have to be added and are individual and distinct. So for an example, when the pickup icon gives some basic information like the description, the name, et cetera. Whereas the equipable item gives the weapon definition that you're equipping. You can have the quick bar, which is the icon and the ammos and the display name that shows up when you actually equip it. So for the quick bar, these are the data elements that it uses. And then the reticles, 
So here you see we have the two reticles that are being added uh, to the UI based on where they sit in the reticle uh, fragment. And then this was an interesting one, initial stats. Here you see the gameplay tags being used to carry a value. So these tags are added to the asset, which is the inventory component instance. And these tags then carry a value and they and there's uh, logic to uh, there's logic to add and remove Put that up here again. I need a weapon spawner. I need a weapon spawner. So when we are dealing with the stacks of spare ammo, we're getting that instance. That's the class, the Lyra inventory item instance object which has these fragments attached to them. And in this particular one, get stat tag count. Yeah, we're using this particular tag and we're adding to it. So we're getting how many we have with this function. This is how many do we currently have. This is how many the standard weapon would have. And we're subtracting the two of them together to get to how, what's the delta between the two of those. And that, that delta is being added. So we're being added back to that point. So we have our spare ammo we started with, and then this is the spare ammo that we have after we walked over the spawner. So the use of the tag to carry values um, means you don't have to create a bunch more variables in your objects. Instead, you can either use fragments in your inventory and then tags inside those fragments to carry more and more data. So that's um, some of the features that we'll be using going forward. So we'll be using the broadcast feature uh, quite heavily. So this notion of using the gameplay message subsystem and broadcasting messages as opposed to hard wiring classes together with casts and things like that. So we're trying to avoid having to cast to different things or make references to different actors. We'll be using these tags and the ability to carry values on tags inside of the inventory items. Um, and we will be using the fragments, which are best seen here, to extend capabilities using various inventory fragments. So you can think of the inventory manager as everything your player has, the fragments being a subset of those into different components that you use in different parts of the systems. Um, and then they're all being managed on the player controller. So the player controller gets these um, components and then those components interact with these various elements. The rest of the uh, elements inside here, I think there's a lot of videos on what they're all used for, when they're all used, um, how they define various weapons. But the important part for go forward is an understanding of the inventory component, sorry, the inventory, the Lyra item inventory instance, the item definition, which is this asset here, the use of fragments, and then the use of gameplay tags inside fragments. So um, from here, we're gonna launch into expanding on those core principles and building out our inventory and item systems. Thanks for watching, have a great day.